My goal here today is to tell you a bit of a story. And the story I'm going to tell you is a story about precision medicine. And I think it's really timely to talk about this today because uh, when we think about bio-IT world and the goals of bringing together biology and information technology, uh, what are the core driving uh, facets of this entire uh, group of people here is the desire to try to use that to advance healthcare, medical care, and biomedical research. So we often talk about precision medicine, but we're not always talking about the same thing. And so, um, as you heard, one of the things that, uh, besides being a professor at, at Harvard and Dana-Farber, one of the things that is found at Genospace, and I'm going to tell you, uh, co-founded it with my uh, partner, Mick Carell, one of the things I'm going to do is tell you a bit of a story. And I'm going to try to illustrate it with what we've learned. But I hope this doesn't turn into an advertisement. I hope this really does drive home some of the key facets of what we've learned about this information ecosystem uh, that we're trying to create as a community to really drive precision medicine forward. So uh, I'm a prof professor at, at Dana-Farber, uh, also my academic appointments at the Harvard School of Public Health. Being an academic, I have lots and lots of academic titles. Rather than paying me more, they give me more titles. Um, <laughs> Not Knight of Sealand, though, but other titles. Uh, I'm on lots of advisory boards that aren't really relevant for what we're going to talk about here today. Uh, but I am going to uh, speak in the context of the work that Mick and I and others have done as part of Genospace. Uh, and again, I really hope to use that experience to illustrate some of the challenges in, in looking at this system. So what's driving this is data. And I like quotes. I like to use quotes. Uh, and this is a quote that I, I think really drives home where we are today, every revolution in science, from the Copernican heliocentric model to the rise of statistical and quantum mechanics, from Darwin's theory of evolution and natural selection to the theory of the gene, has been driven by one and only one thing, and that's access to data. And I like to quote great thinkers, and of course, this is the best thinker I could find to illustrate this. <laughs> Take photos, use it, uh, but uh, tweet it. Uh, Probably too many characters, so multiple tweets. But uh, you know, I was really looking for a quote that tries to capture this. But if you think about it, it's data that drives innovation and revolution. And for me, that's what's really exciting about where we are today. So uh, I'm really honored to be able to give the opening talk here at BioIT World. Uh, I admire um, everyone who's been involved in producing this over the years, because I think even you know, 10 or 12 years ago when the conference first started, they were really um, prescient in looking to the future and understanding where our discipline was going to move, where biomedical research was going to move. So I'm going to talk about this in the context of its pieces. The first is IT. And one of the lessons, so Mick and I founded Genospace a little bit more than two years ago, but we spent a long time thinking about what the challenges were and where the opportunities were and where the field was moving. And really a lot of it comes from thinking about computing and how the computing paradigm has changed. If you wanted to set up a system to do precision medicine, one of the things you'd have to do is, is set up servers, buy lots of computers, and get very matrix-looking uh, systems, and uh, really make a huge investment in capital equipment that two or three years down the road is outdated. And I think one of the big transitions we started to see was really the rise of cloud computing, that what we were able to do um, to think about doing is capturing data and information and storing it in a place where we could afford to store it because the amount we had to pay to store it only depended on how much space we needed. If we had to do big computing, we could scale up to do big computing and then scale that computing back as needed. So this was really an interesting opportunity, but there were a whole host of challenges in thinking about how we actually employ the cloud, data security, data transport, um, data integration, data access. And so while it was an opportunity, it really required that we think carefully about how we manage that opportunity and use it to our advantage. One of the other things, though, that sort of really got me thinking, and in fact, I tell the story of coming in one day, and Mick and I both worked together at Dana-Farber, and coming in and talking to Mick, we'd been talking about how to do precision medicine. And I heard a story about the iPhone. And I walked in, it was on NPR, and they were talking about apps and how apps were available. And I heard this, and something caught my mind. And I walked into Mick, uh, Mick's office, and I looked at him, and I said, there's an app for that. And I walked out. And I realized 
that that was really one of the key things. Okay, you can buy an iPhone. You may love it, you may hate it. You know, it's gotten better. It used to be a pretty crappy phone, but they were everywhere. And why were they everywhere? It's because it wasn't one phone, but it was really a whole host of applications. The thing that made the iPhone really valuable was recognizing that everybody had unique needs and creating an opportunity for people to create applications that were going to address their needs. One of those needs is making phone calls, but you know, my son playing Angry Birds is very different than me uh, responding to emails at work. So if you think about that, and we think about precision medicine, one of the things that we started to recognize was that everybody had unique needs, and we had to think about how you address those. So that's the IT piece. What's the bio piece? Well, you have to start somewhere. And I'll start with Watson and Crick, since the, the anniversary of sequencing and publishing, or not sequencing, publishing the structure of DNA just recently passed. And what's really exciting about this is that in 1953, okay, not that long ago, 61 years ago, a cartoon representing the structure of DNA was the first representation we had of what's now become the stock and trade for almost everything that most of us do at one point or another. And what that motivated was really the sequencing of the human genome, a project that was completed depending on how you declare success and completion something like 13 years ago. So we went from a cartoon drawing to a collection of 3,000 ACs, Gs, and Ts representing the genome, a preliminary catalog of genes, and great excitement about where this is going to take us. In fact, if you read the early press releases with Clinton and Venter and Collins, there's all this discussion about transforming medicine and what it was going to do. So you could ask yourselves 13 years later, has that original genome sequence transformed medicine? And I think if you, if you answer that honestly, you realize that assembling a reference genome has not in and of itself transformed medicine. It's really the technologies that have been spawned in producing the reference genome and exploiting it that have opened up new avenues of investigation and really been the transformative element in genomics and the birth of precision medicine. What it's allowed us to do is to start capturing big data. But big data in biomedicine is very different than big data in a lot of other domains. I've been to conferences where big data experts working in physics, and I used to work in physics, uh, working in astronomy, working in uh, economics, will stand up and tell us about their challenges with big data. But when they talk about big data, they're often talking about a big volume of data. But when we talk about big data, we talk about three things, volume, variety, and velocity. And all three of those hit home in a very real way when we talk about precision medicine and biomedical research. I'll focus on genomic medicine, but in fact, we can look at radio, uh, radiographic images. We can start to look at EEGs and EKGs and electronic monitoring. Uh, we can start to look at um, the measured man with things like the Fitbit and the Nike fuel band measuring everything we do and apps that keep track of everywhere we are. Uh, but if we simply think about genomic data, that has to be placed in the context of clinical data and other information to really provide interpretation for the underlying information and to allow us to deliver it, right? If I were to sequence any one of you in this room, given the fact that most of you are over 20, uh, what I could probably tell you based on your genome sequence in truth, not getting in trouble with the FDA, is that uh, you should probably eat well, you should exercise, you should not smoke, you should maintain a healthy weight. Because the truth is, if you had a highly penetrant Mendelian disease or disorder or a genetic variant that was associated with that, you would probably know it already, right? On the other hand, if I were to sequence your colon cancer genome, if you had colon cancer and I discovered you had a KRAS mutation, I could tell your oncologist that uh, treating you with EGFR inhibitors wouldn't work. Context is everything. So the challenge is to bring all of this information together with other sources of information to better address a wide range of fundamental problems, including the basis for human disease and the optimum therapy for patients. So those are really our goals. And what's driving it is actually the falling cost. So this is an adaptation of the cost curve from the NHGRI. You can look at their version, you can look at other versions. Um, it's often presented as uh, a, a drop in cost that fall, in which the cost of sequencing is falling faster than Moore's law, which makes absolutely no sense to me since we're not putting transistors on chips, we're putting bases in databases. Uh, but 
Uh, I think really what that speaks to is the fact that in Moore's law, the number of transistors on a chip was projected to double every 18 months. And there was a long period during which the cost of genome sequencing was falling by 33% per quarter. The first genome was done in 2000. If you look at the cost in 2001, the estimate was it would cost $100 million. It would take months to sequence your genome. It would take an army full of people. In 2007, Illumina and Applied Biosystems introduced new technologies that caused that rapid downturn in the cost of sequencing. And I like to think about that fall in, in really personal terms. If I look at, at 2009, and I'm going to try to avoid using the, the pointer since I don't know if people in the other rooms can see, but in 2009, the cost of sequencing a genome had dropped to about $100,000. And I used to show a slide like this, and I used to give talks about where the, uh, the field was headed. And I always used to say if my wife or son had a rare tumor, I'd mortgage our house and sequence their tumor genome to be able to inform their therapy. And what really drives this home for me is today, oops, can you go back one, please? I don't know if I can go back. Uh, today, the cost of sequencing a genome is well under $10,000. Illumina has announced technologies that they claim will drive it to $1,000 this year. The bottom line is most of you probably paid more for airfare and registration fees to come to this con uh, conference than it would cost to sequence your genome, okay? I can pay for the genome with a credit card. And that simple statement really drives home why the data revolution in biomedical research is here. The cost of generating sequence data is now becoming the re within the reach of probably everybody in this room and everybody listening in other rooms. So this is the point at which we have to start thinking about what we're actually going to do with all of this data once we start generating it. But what's the cost of the analysis? So this was actually an opinion piece that was published by Elaine Martis in 2010 in which he said, well, you know, even if it's a $1,000 genome, what about the $100,000 it costs to analyze the data? And I've been at conferences with other people who will stand up and still today say, well, it costs $100,000 to sequence the genome. But that's, that's a ridiculous statement, okay? It could cost $100,000, it could cost $1. It depends on what you want to do with it and what questions you want to ask. And I think this is one of the key lessons that we've really learned. So I think about the ecoverse. Right? The most important omic science is economics. And um, if we look at the econ economic universe, it really speaks to where we have to think about sequencing and the cost of analysis if we want to see precision medicine. Okay? And this is something we've really learned in, in, in real uh, applications over the last few years. Right? This $100,000 analysis is really the, the domain of research applications. All right? If I want to sequence large numbers of genomes and analyze them to look for new markers and new associations with disease, that's a research question. That's not a question that in most instances is going to have a direct impact on treating patients. There are also translational applications, though, and these are applications which, that we see a lot in the pharmaceutical industry. These are applications in which we see pharma companies sequencing genomes to try to identify biomarkers that they can associate with response to segment populations to better direct therapies and to get approval for drugs by identifying pop populations in which, there, in which there's efficacy. But they're clinical applications. And some of these applications are actually reasonably expensive. But if you look at what's clinically actionable today in any disease, the number of markers is actually pretty small. The number of gene variants is pretty small. It's not. 25,000 genes that we have to worry about. If I have a mutation in my actin gene and I have colon cancer, it's not going to tell you anything about how to treat me, probably. So if I look at each and every disease, the number of actionable variants, if I think about practicing clinical medicine, is small. Now, what Elaine Martis may have been looking at is actually the diagnostic odyssey. If we sequence some, you know, some kid who has a rare disease and sequences family members and we don't know what the cause is and we put a group of people together in a room to try to sort it out and explore every, po every possible uh, iteration and every possible alteration in the context of what we know about disease, then maybe that's a $100,000 analysis. But in fact, most of what we see is probably down in the lower left-hand corner. And in fact, if you really look at this, not just in the context of research or medicine, but think about probably one of the main problems in precision medicine, which is reimbursement, being able to have a test that you could actually have an insurance company paid for probably means you have to live somewhere down here where the cost of sequencing is less than the cost of generating the data. 
And in truth, it probably has to live somewhere down in the bottom, where it's only a few dollars to a few hundred dollars to go in and identify those variants which are relevant for treating disease. And that's one of the important lessons I think we've learned over the last few years, is that you have to look at the cost in context and in the context of the questions that you want to ask. So we have bio, we have IT, how do we put it together, what's the real challenge? So if you think about this, one of the things which is clearly driving this is this explosion of genomic data. One of the other things, though, uh, is really the variety of data and what we need to interpret it. And what we have to be positioned to do to address research questions as well as clinical questions is to sort of sit at this nexus where we bring in uh, health record data, we bring in data about our patients, we bring in information about their genomes, we bring in other types of laboratory data to put it into context and really try to interpret it. We need to have an appropriate computing infrastructure in place, and I think increasingly there are very good arguments as to why cloud-based solutions work. I've had people say, well, we can't put the data in the cloud, we're going to put it in our data center, and you ask them where their data center in is, and it's across the river in some warehouse they rented, and it's guarded by mall cops, right? While if you look at Amazon, I'm sure in their cloud solution, they're guarded by Blackwater helicopters flying around overhead, <laughs> right? I mean, who am I going to trust, and does it matter where I put the data? What's really important is how secure the infrastructure is that's storing the data and how secure the infrastructure is that's transporting the data. But where it lives isn't necessarily the key issue. I talked to somebody once, he said, well, our data solution is, our data, our data is secure because it's in the cloud. And I said, well, why is it secure? And he said, well, nobody can find it. And I said, <laughs> Those of you, you know, who practice units, that's dev slash null, right? Nobody can find it. Um, so, you know, you have to be able to find it, but you have to keep it secure. And then the last piece, and, and this sort of goes back to the iPhone analogy I made earlier, there are different people who want to look at the same data and ask different questions. And so what you have to do is think about that in the context of how you actually deliver solutions. So again, I'm going to use examples from what we've been doing at Genospace to illustrate this, but I hope you don't see them as limited. I hope you really see them as exemplars of what these key challenges are. So we think about the, the universe now as really having different components. They're research components, they're clinical components, and they're components which are focused on patients. And believe me, patients want access to genomic data. At Dana-Farber, I, I can't tell you how many patients have walked into my office, walked into my lab, and said, can I pay you to sequence my tumor genome? And my answer always has to be no, but Hopefully, there are people out there who can give you that kind of information. And increasingly, we're starting to see providers who will deliver that kind of solution. So we look at these different segments of, of the consumers of genomic data. But if you think about what they all want to consume, whether they're asking research questions or want to deliver uh, information at the point of care, whether they're patients who want to manage their own disease, what's common to all of these are the patients. In research, we look at population level questions. The primary use case, the primary question in biomedical research is can I define one cohort of patients and compare it with another cohort of patients which differ in some subtle way to understand what really distinguishes them mechanistically, biologically, mutationally. When we deal with clinical care, we want to look not at those populations of patients, but we want to transfer what we know to individual patients. But all of the same data and information about their clinical status, their sex, their drug treatment, their survival, um, are going to be important for understanding what we tell those patients. And if we think about patients themselves, the patients are very interested in having access to data, and many of them are very interested in sharing the data and getting information back. So the, at the core of all of this are the patients and patient information. And again, if you start thinking about those patients, you have to think about data security. Genomes are fundamentally identifiable. Uh, Yanov Ehrlich, who's going to talk later, is going to uh, maybe talk about identifying patients using genomic data and public sources of information or identifying individuals. The code has been cracked if the genome's available. So we have to think about security. We have to think about encryption. We have to make that data secure, but we have to make the patients and their data 
the center. So what are the driving needs? Well, for personalized precision medicine to become a reality, we need systems that can provide secure storage of data. We have to manage very diverse data. And again, one of the things we're starting to see in the practice of precision medicine is it's not just genomic sequence that's important, but genomic variants in the context of other types of information, that knowing the mutational status may not tell us as much as knowing copy number. But the copy number and mutational status together can tell us more than either one can by itself. We need advanced analytic and visualization tools, right? We don't want people like me standing in the way of everyone else accessing and analyzing data. We want to really democratize the availability of data and the availability of tools to analyze those data so that domain experts can really start to explore what's there. We need the ability to share data information and to do that securely. But at the point of care, we also have to think about how we take all of this and turn it into our ability to deliver clinically actionable information in concise forms that even physicians can understand. Okay? So we've tried to build that by addressing a lot of the things I've talked about. We've created a system that at its core is a cloud-based uh, secure data storage, encryption, and access technology. The data is encrypted, encrypted in, transit and in, uh, at, in transit and at rest. Um, we're very careful about providing access and different levels of access. We've th thought about ways to uh, use modern web-based technologies uh, to integrate diverse data types. We've thought about ways to visualize and make data exploration actually fun. And we've really thought about the people who are going to consume the data and the fact that when they consume the data and use it, they want to take ownership of it. So the solutions we provide are solutions which are really branded for the, the people who are using our systems. So I'm going to give you three examples of how we've tried to attack this problem that I hope illustrate some of what I've been talking about. The first is the idea of doing population-based screens, taking 1,000 patients maybe collected in a rare disease, a relative rare disease over a number of sites, uh, linking those patients and their genomic data uh, with other sources of data and information and following them over time, and really working with different groups who are willing to fund the collection of that kind of data. Now, this sounds like a really interesting exercise, but in fact, one of our first partners at Genospace was the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation and their COMPASS study. COMPASS is a really innovative study. I love the design of this study. They have four pharma partners that have put up $20 million. They raised $20 million. It's a five or 10 year longitudinal study in which they're looking at 1,000 treatment naive patients, sequencing them every year and adding in clinical data so you can watch their disease respond in near real time to therapy. It's a fascinating study. Uh, they approached us with the, the, the goal of taking that data and making it accessible and providing it to different groups. And so the problem was they had all these different sources of data and information. They needed it to integrate it. They needed it uh, shared among the pharma companies, eventually shared by uh, the sponsoring institutions that were recruiting patients, and then eventually shared with the public so that other scientists could come in and analyze the data. And so what we try to do is create a system that would allow them to do that. And um, we have a booth downstairs. You can look at what we've implemented. This is an example of one of these portals that we've created. And what it's designed to do is to make data analysis easy. The primary use case which really drives a lot of this is cohort identification. And if you think about this, what we try to do on the left-hand side is provide a set of clinical and genomic variables that one can use to define a group of patients. That's a cohort. And as you define that cohort, what happens on the, uh, the right-hand side is all of the parameters that go into that cohort start to get populated. Um, there are always displays. Whenever we look at data, we want to give people something back. And that's one of the things we found is really helpful, that when you look at data, you can see features and distributions that may suggest other things. But we also have statistics. And one of the things, oops, can you go back one, please? I keep on hitting the wrong button. Um, there's an attribute analyzer that actually goes through and does statistics in real time on the fly based on your cohorts to look for correlations. So the whole goal is as you start to define a cohort, 
you have tools to help you understand what the properties of those cohorts are and to begin to really look for correlations. Once you have one cohort, you can compare it to other cohorts and really contrast them across all the available data to look for confounding factors or look for genomic factors that may be contributing or to look to see if there's even something simple like a difference in survival. The goal is to try to make data analysis easy, which if you want to enable precision medicine, at least on the research side, is something you have to do. One of my favorite comments from one of the people at the MMRF when they started using this interface was that it was addictive. You start playing with data, you want to ask more questions. And there's nothing better than that if you think about trying to build a solution that's going to allow people to draw meaningful conclusions from data. You want to want to play with the data. So what we try to do is provide uh, a solution for research that really brings together the different elements, diverse data. We want to integrate demographic, clinical, diagnostic, therapeutic, genomic data together. The primary use case is analyzing populations. We could ask about individual genes, and there's tools to do that. We could ask about pathways, and there are tools to do that. But most of the questions we find people want to ask are those population-level questions. The goal is often to discover biomarkers, variants, something associated with the different groups that you can use to inform some end stage, like treatment. Um, and one of the things you'd also like to understand is what those populations tell you about your ability to do things like clinical trials. Okay? So that's a basic research question. What about translational research? What if we have lots of patients? Uh, we have lots of clinical sites where those patients are located, so places around the country. We have pharmaceutical companies that want to run trials. They have drugs that target different groups of patients. If you talk to the pharma companies, one of their biggest challenges in running trials is actually recruiting patients who meet the criteria of the trials. And with more and more directed therapies, that's becoming harder because they have to identify patients with specific genomic lesions or other biomarkers. So what you need is a potential matchmaker. You need an interested organization that can try to bring together the patients and the pharma companies, the patients and the sponsors of the trials. So this was actually something that arose out of our work with the MMRF as they were starting the COMPASS study. We went to them and we said, well, look, you're looking at 1,000 patients in COMPASS, but there are 10,000 newly diagnosed patients every year. What about trying to collect data and information from them and using that data information, which is self-reported, but I can tell you is often as good or better than what you get from electronic health records. Uh, in large part because if cancer patients really care about understanding their disease or their family members really care about understanding their disease. And so if you could collect that kind of information, what you might be able to do is start to address these concerns. Look at the pharma companies that want to target uh, uh, trials for specific patients and create a system in which those patients want to give information back to get linked to the trials and become involved in these trials. So what we ended up doing with the MMRF was creating a community gateway. You can think of it sort of like patients like me. You can think of it sort of like Facebook. But the, the thing that really drove this was that there was a trusted source, the MMRF, as the, the, the key holder, as the gateway to this community. But what we had to do beyond just attracting them with somebody they could trust to provide useful information is provide an opportunity for them to connect with each other, to connect with clinical trials, but also to get something back. And so what we did was we created an interface in which the patients were incentivized to contribute self-reported data. This includes uh, clinical parameters, genomic parameters if they know them, and many patients with myeloma know. Uh, genomic rearrangement status, which uh, rearrangements they have, they know what drugs they're being treated on, uh, and there's actually the opportunity for them to provide information through the course of therapy that they can monitor and keep track of, okay? I go to my physician every year, I get my blood work, I look at my cholesterol levels and other things, I go home, I enter them in Excel and I graph them to see how well I'm doing. Patients with cancer want to do that too, and we create an environment in which they can do that. But if they see something that's worrisome, they can share it with an expert from the MMRF or other patients and get information back. This was actually launched at the same time the public research portal was launched in September of last year. And within three days, they had 1,000 patients sign up. 
Okay? So it's been a really great resource to bring patients together to provide a platform that incentivizes them to become part of the solution and really become involved. So we've created this community-based resource. But what we realize is it's not only something that helps the patients, but it's something which provides the opportunity for the MMRF to collect data, to look for biomarkers, to look for other sources of information with patient-reported data. Now, you could argue that that may not be accurate, that you really want to go to clinical data, and there's nothing wrong with that. But you can find things here in 10,000 patients that you couldn't find with 50 or 100 or 1,000 patients. And while you may have to go back and validate it in a more rigorously controlled study population, in fact, you get really useful information that you can use today from big populations. And so this is a really interesting approach to think about how we address the future of precision medicine when all of us are participants in having our genomes or some portion of our genomes sequenced. The last piece, though, the last sort of case study is how we deliver data and information at the point of care. How do you actually take all of this and turn it into something that patients and physicians can use? To do this, you have to think about where there are useful indications. And if you think about it, the place where we have the best opportunity to make inroads into delivering precision medicine to patients today is probably in, in cancer. So we have a lot more data in cancer. We have a lot more associations between genetic variants and response. We have a lot more prognostic uh, markers in cancer than we do in other diseases. You could argue that there are other areas like cardiovascular disease, neuropsychiatric disease, newborn screening. I mean, there, there are many, many other potential areas. But the truth is the largest number of genomic markers we have, which numbers a few hundred at best, uh, is in cancer. So how do you address this? Well, who are the consumers? You actually have patients and they're treating physicians who are ultimately the consumers of the precision medicine information. Uh, that cons the, the information you deliver the, to them, though, is really driven not just by mutations, but by other clinical and laboratory data that you want to bring together. You need sources of information and annotation and really addressing how you put together informative sources of information is vitally important. In a research context, we want to know all the associations, and we control PubMed. And for any variants, uh, I or some of my colleagues can do biopoetry and construct a really lovely story telling you about what those variants mean. But patients don't want stories. Their physicians don't want stories. They want to know what the empirical evidence says links certain variants to certain responses. So you need well-curated sources of data that represent the state of the art and the standard of care. And so what you need to be able to do is to provide that information back to treating physicians in a way that makes sense. So one of the things that we've done over the past two years is work with uh, a group called PATH Group. They're one of the largest physician-owned private oncology or pathology practices in the country. And what they did was a few years ago, they recapitalized their company. They took the money, they invested it in building a sequencing factory, and they started offering genomic assays. The problem they had was they had lots of legacy systems with different sources of data and information on the patients. They needed to bring it together. They needed to synthesize it, and they needed to deliver a solution that would allow their pathologist to take the information and produce a report that could go out to physicians. So what we did was we created a system we call Full View. It's actually a really nice templated system. It takes all of the sources of metadata and provides it in context. So there's some smart analytics that run behind. So the physicians who are looking at the genomic assays don't look at everything. They look primarily at the assays that are part of the standard of care because that's what the physicians want to know. That's also, in truth, what's reimbursable. So that's what they can be paid to deliver. So that's the first line of defense. But they're also interested in things like what clinical trials are available, and they're interested in what the other potential therapies are. So this is a nice example, but what does it produce? What you have to do is deliver a report. And actually, delivering this report is really interesting because it tells you about where precision medicine is and where we want to be. When we first started designing the reports, we thought, oh, our physicians are going to want really slick web-enabled, tablet-enabled reports. They can look at their iPads and show you know, their patients the pathways that are being affected mutations. And we showed them this, and they all went, oh, I don't want to see that. They said, what we want is a simple one or two page report. It's got to be a PDF. 
right? Why does it have to be a PDF? And this is the thing that's scary. So they could print it out and scan it into their EMRs, okay? The EMRs couldn't even load a PDF, right? The EMRs were designed to turn the room of files into a, a disk of JPEGs, and that's where they are. The font had to be faxable at five to 10 times and readable. Because, you know, who has fax machines, right? You go to your doctor's office, they're fax machines. Nobody else has fax machines, OK? <laughs> if you go to your doctor, though, you get a stack of paper, right? If you want your medical report, you don't get a disk. You get a stack of paper. Electronic medical records run on paper, and so that's what they wanted. And it had to be really simple to interpret. The language also had to be suggestive. Even if something was absolutely clinically demonstrated not to work, you can't tell them that. The language has to suggest that it may not work. It's unlikely to work, uh, in large part because the physicians that they decide to ignore this don't want to be sued, right? So there are really practical concerns in building this. But if you do it right, it actually works really well. So one of our, I think our fifth case was uh, a young a glioblastoma patient whose disease was refractory to treatment. He had a rare mutation. Um, and in fact, what they discovered, his physician in, in, uh, in Shelbyville, Alabama, discovered that at the University of Alabama, there's actually a clinical trial enrolling that was not based on disease site, but on the particular mutation he had, one of the basket trials. And so delivering that kind of information really early on for us demonstrated, uh, with our partners at PATH Group, demonstrated the ability and the value of clean, simple reports that physicians could get. We've since gone beyond that. The physicians have now come back and said, we want more. This is so exciting. We're learning so much. Give us more. So we've gone back to a nice tablet-enabled report, a web page that they can go to and visit. And in fact, we've created for them the ability to give access to their patients to essentially the same underlying web page. The physician is the gatekeeper. He has a unique key that allows the patient in. Once the patient is in, the patient can start learning about their own disease, or their family members can learn about disease. In the past few years, my wife and I have helped both her, uh, yeah, both her parents wrestle with colon cancer. And the thing I can tell you as a family member of someone with colon cancer is that my wife knew more about their disease most days than their treating physicians did. She was the expert because she was invested in understanding it. And patients and their families want access to this kind of information. So we've created solutions for clinical labs that try to integrate these diverse data types and bring them together in ways that make sense and deliver meaningful information to physicians and to patients, information that's validated, but also information that allows them to explore alternatives if they're interested in doing that. So what else do we need? What else do we really need to put this together? Well, one of the things we need are sources of annotation. I can tell you that at Genospace, one of the things we did was partner with Thomson Reuters. We've been working with them to try to develop a scalable solution to really put into place a genomic variant database linked to proven therapies. Our thinking in doing this is that today, any group of 10 people can probably sit in a room and annotate the existing mutations. But as the pace of discovery grows, and the number of variants grow, and the number of different clinical indications in different diseases grow, you need an information management company to try to put that together. But it's one of the key things you have to think about is how you generate the annotation and how you keep that annotation current. Okay? So what we've tried to do is create what I think of as an operating system for precision medicine. We realize that there's no one solution. That people say precision medicine, but they're talking about different things. So at its core, what we have to recognize is that there are many different components in this ecosystem, in this universe. And what we need are solutions to try to bring them together. All right? So this is what we've tried to create. I hope the lessons that, uh, that have driven our thinking are lessons that are valuable to you. So what have we learned? Well, the first is that data is going to really drive the rise and maturity of precision medicine. But genomic data without context has limited value. We really need the clinical data and other sources of information integrated if we're going to make it useful. In working with PATH Group, they would tell us that before they started using our system, doing a single report using copy, num copy number variation would take a trained pathologist almost a day. That's just not a scalable solution. They need systems that are going to allow them to do that in 20 minutes. 
and to be able to reuse what they've learned and to link information together. So we need to take that information and put it into context and make it accessible. There are many producers and many consumers of genomic data and precision medicine information. And what we have to do is think about how we create systems that allow each one of those groups to try to get as much out of the data and information as possible. But it's really interesting and important to recognize that many different groups may ask different questions of the same underlying data. So we want to create a system that allows them to use that data in ways that address their specific needs. So each member of the precision medicine ecosystem really has seemingly unique needs. But what you discover at the end of the day is that those needs often overlap. We may talk to somebody about getting access to reporting tools. But once they start seeing that they're amassing large quantities of genomic data, they want to look in those tools for trends. They want to look at populations. They want to look for biomarkers. They want to look in their own data to try to recruit patients for clinical trials by matching them with pharma companies that, are, that have trials with specific genomic inclusion criteria. There are lots of opportunities to explore data independent of how you decide to collect it. So information management is really the key to the future, but provided we keep patients at the center. So if I have to give you a take home message, it's as you start to think about precision medicine and think about this universe of different consumers and different producers, try to remember that at the center of that are the patients whose data we're actually collecting and whose needs we actually have to try to serve. So I open with a quote from a great thinker, I'll actually close with a good quote. This is a quote from William Gibson, the science fiction author. He said, the future is here, it's just not widely distributed yet. So hopefully this meeting is really uh, the start of the future of precision medicine. And hopefully in the years to come, we'll be hearing from more people delivering keynotes talking about how this information in the context of the precision medicine universe is really being turned into something that's not only driving research, but providing benefits to patients. So I'll just close by noting that uh, we have a booth downstairs. Niall O'Connor is going to be talking about some of the, the approaches we have to data security. But I'm going to be here for the entire conference. And if you don't have a chance to ask questions today, I'd be more than happy to share my experiences. If you know me, Kevin said I talk for too long, so I'm trying to keep under time. But if you also want to know how we're using this data for research and some of the work we're doing at Dana-Farber, I'm more than happy to tell you about that, too. So thank you. I said you talk for long, not too long. A, there's a, a key difference. Uh, John's also going to be moderating a panel, in case you hadn't seen it, on the last afternoon of the conference on Thursday from 2.30 to 4.00. Uh, in tracks, I think it's at cross tracks one to three uh, from data to knowledge, meeting the challenges of genomic medicine with a number of the partners that you just heard uh, reference. Uh, we may and some others. And others. So we may struggle to find some microphones. So if you have a question, put your hand up. I'll come to you in a second. And also in the overflow room, if you're ready for questions, uh, I'll come to you in a minute first. But since we have this gentleman in the front row, do you have a question? Shout, and we'll re re I'll repeat. repeat. I'll use my uh, stage voice. <laughs> do you do that? I, I really like that. What facet uh, do you see of, of, of your operating system for this kind of stuff supporting the management of hypotheses about disease causation? It's like another scale-up problem. So the question really comes to looking at uh, the microbiome and capturing microbiome data. And my background is in physics. And in physics, we had this, this approach to looking at data in which we think about different tiers of data. And it's something that's really sort of propagated forward. We can collect all the raw sequence data. That data on most days is not useful. If we take that raw sequence data, we map it back to a genome. And for the human genome, we create list of variants. Right? And it's really that variant call data that we operate on on a daily basis, but we want to be able to drill back. If we look at microbiome data, what we want to do is essentially the same thing. We can collect massive quantities of data, but to interpret it, we have to filter it down to some core set of variables. So what we've tried to do is create a data storage system, but also an archived annotated system that allows us to link different data types together that's really scalable, that's built on modern NoSQL internet technologies. So 
Uh, we're trying to use state of the art to address these, these really difficult data management questions. I think the good thing about the system we built, and again, I think this is another take home lesson, is don't be too tied to any technology. If something better comes along, you have to be prepared to switch it out, and you need a, uh, a modular system that allows you to do that. So the, the, the follow up is just would you consider storing perpetually, continuously, hypotheses about? Uh, you could potentially store hypotheses, and it depends on your application. So on a research side, that's a, a viable solution. On the clinical side, it's not. Other questions here in the hall? We have a microphone now. Yes. Thank you. I'm just curious, what about sort of after the clinical trials and after the immediate treatment, do you have plans to kind of extend some of the patient-facing stuff into sort of real-world evidence and how how they are doing post-treatment, how drugs exist in the real world, maybe bringing in some of the other external factors that might affect uh, well-being and, and, and how the disease progresses or not progresses over time. So one of my favorite stories about drugs is that Viagra was a cardiovascular drug that didn't work well but had a nice side effect. Uh, so being able to, to capture that kind of information is important. As we've started to talk to pharma companies, one of the things that they've gotten very interested in is the idea of pairing something like a community gateway along with the clinical trial. So they can collect all of the clinical data, but they can start to collect other data and information that might be useful. Their drug may perform as well as somebody else's, but it may have better side effects, or the patients may be happy, or they may get a really nice other side effect surprise like with Viagra that they didn't expect. Uh, that could be an added bonus. So, you know, I, I think there are other opportunities to collect that kind of data. We're not trying to position ourselves to be uh, the analyst of those data. We want to create the system that will enable people to do that. But I think you're absolutely right. The more data and information we can collect, the better off we're going to be. I always like to say the next large cohort study should be everybody. Let's check in with the overflow room. Uh, Jerry, are you there? Do you have any questions for us? Is that a question? Go ahead. Going once, going twice. Hi, yes. Recommend. Go ahead. Can you suggest or recommend a genome browser that would be most suitable for a consumer? <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, there are lots of genome browsers. Each one of them has its own nice properties. Some of them are good. Some of them aren't so good. Uh, some of them, yeah, you know, it depends on the application, but yeah. You know, I, I think there's still a lot of work to be done, depending on the, who, who the consumer is. A patient is going to have very different questions than a research scientist, so.